Good morning, church. Uh, I was told that I've misspoke. Huge surprise. I, I never mess up. Uh, the Singing Church Women concert is Thursday. I may have said Thursday and then Wednesday and then Thursday again. It's Thursday. Wednesday's the Grand Prix race. So, Aren't you glad I clarified that for you? You would not have been able to listen to me preach had I not clarified that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, would you open them with me to the Gospel of Matthew? We're, we've been looking as a church family at the Sermon on the Mount. We've finished the Beatitudes, and we're looking at this section that, that, that we're calling tension. Jesus draws attention to the fact that as a believer, there's a tension between the way the world puts its pressures upon you and the way the Word of God exhorts its force over you. And there's, a, there's this tension that I know I'm called to live for Christ and I live in a world that's fallen and separated. And sometimes that tension can make you feel perhaps like that rope does, that you're just coming apart at the seams and you wonder, do I really have it all together and can I truly live and be the way God has called me to live and be in this world? So I hope that these messages are designed to help us to lean into that tension and say, yes, I, I am, and I can be, and I will be all that God has called me to be. So let's turn to the Word of God. The Word of God says, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse, verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together as we begin to study God's word. Father, thank you for this reminder. You have called us and you have proclaimed we are the light of the world and I pray this morning Father that we would rest in your goodness to us that we would be reminded of who we are in Christ and Father that you would meet us in this place change and transform hearts and minds even in this moment that we would leave this place changed by the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus and for his glory we pray amen This is such a familiar passage. It's, it's so familiar, in fact, that we have a candle that we've been lighting every week for a better part of almost two years now. And we've been saying, you are the light of the world and you hold within you light that you are to proclaim to other people. And so I, I want to just stop here at the beginning of this and say, even though this is a familiar passage of Scripture, even though there's some familiarity with the truth that is here, may we pause in this moment and say, but God, help me to hear afresh and anew what this means for me. So, the reminder that you and I are the light of the world and this tension that we live in to, to be light in a darkened place, the inescapable truth is this. Christian, never forget that you live in a world lost in darkness. The world in which you live, the place where God has sent you, is a place that is lost in darkness. And globally, we know this to be true. Globally, 67%, nearly 7 out of every 10 people that walk this planet do not follow Christ. When we sang that, that hymn just a moment ago, facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, it's that kind of sobering statistic sh that should indeed drive us to our knees. Think about this for a moment. Globally, the place where you and I live, seven, almost seven out of ten people do not follow Christ. And here's something more astounding. One out of every four people that are alive today on planet Earth have never heard the gospel 
message or have such limited access to the gospel message that it would be like it was a brand new message. That, that is one reason, church family, that I am so glad that we work together cooperatively. Do, do you realize that you, as members of First Baptist Church in Duncan, Oklahoma, are part of a global missions sending organization? That this isn't just numbers that don't mean anything. That, that when we give here, we take a portion of what we give and we pass it along and we are supporting near a little over 4,000 missionaries globally that are impacting lostness in our world. And it's why I'm so encouraged to be able to even pastor this group of people because on the first Sunday night of every month, you are so faithful to come and to pray and lift up the unique partnerships that God has given us as a church family. We have such unique partnerships around the globe. And this morning, as we gather in this beautiful room, I want to remind you we have partnerships with people in East Asia, and we have a partnership where there's a group of house church type apartment meetings that in the midst of a coronavirus outbreak in their nation gather faithfully to come and worship the Lord God with a mattress over the door at times so that if they are too expressive in their worship, their neighbors won't call the police. We live in a world that is lost in darkness. But in that world, we are light. We, we live in the, in the state of Oklahoma. And that doesn't mean that we're immune to the effects of lostness or darkness around us. We obviously know the room that we're sitting in is not full. But you can go to churches all across our community this morning and you're going to find very similar situations. Oh yeah, you'll find two or three or maybe four that are full. But if you were to drive the streets of Duncan this morning, you would find houses occupied and full. You would find businesses going about and doing all their normal activities. And you would recognize that even here in our community, there is lostness that God has called us to impact. And one of the unique things that we're going to have the opportunity to do later this month, to be light in a darkened community right where we are, is to serve the people of our community people who are probably otherwise just sitting at home on Sunday mornings, when we gather for worship at 9 o'clock on the 29th and we go out and commissioned to serve them at 10 o'clock, we're going to be serving the, that community in a profound way, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ through acts of service and ministry to them. But Christian, I don't want you to ever forget that you are living in a world that is lost in darkness. That is perhaps, if you hear nothing else, if you would just allow that to resonate in your heart this morning and realize that you've been called to make a difference, that you've been called to be light in darkness, then, then we've communicated all this text has to say for us. But speaking of that darkness, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to the, those who are perishing. For the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers that they may not see the glory of Christ. There's a real sense in the darkness in which we have that people's eyes are blinded by Satan himself. Here's the reality. The reality of lostness is spiritual. And I think that the people that are dead spiritually have no idea that they're lost in this darkness. 
They're just wandering through life and they're going about life doing the things that they normally do. They have no idea that there is a spiritual death that is upon them and you and I are called to shine light into that darkness and penetrate blinded eyes with the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that sounds like an impossible task, it is. Because there's nothing that you and I can do in our strength and our power to remove that veil. And it reminds us that prayer is the foundational tool for evangelism. That you and I need to be a people of prayer and we need to be praying for our community. And so on Sunday nights when we've been saying that we do pray, go, pray, grow, this is the second Sunday night of the month. We're going tonight. We're going to be visiting homes in the Emerson District and we're going to be inviting them to church. But next week when we gather, we're going to be praying for our community. And by the way, next week when we gather in here, we will have names of people who we're going to be serving on the 29th. We're gonna have their addresses and their names and we're gonna ask you to be praying for these people as we go to serve them, that they would be receptive and open to hear the gospel message. Prayer is the foundational tool for evangelism. If it is a spiritual issue and there are spiritually dead people who are lost in their sin, then we must ask that the God of light, whose light we reflect, that the God of light would remove the veil from their eyes and open their eyes to see the beauty of Christ. But the reality is that far too many Christians are walking across the battlefield empty-handed without a weapon in their hand at all. We forfeited the right to pray for the lost. We forfeited the right to pray for the power of God to move. And we just walk aimlessly across the battlefield of life, not realizing that God has called us to engage the culture in which we live. And when I say the word battlefield, I mean it intentionally. Friends, if the, if the reality of lostness is a spiritual reality, it reminds us that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. And you and I, who are the light of the world, should be praying to the God of all creation to shine forth his light brightly that all would be saved. And where does that begin? It begins in your own family. As you pray for loved ones who are far from the Lord, it begins in your own work site where you pray for coworkers who are far from the Lord. It begins in your campuses, in your schools, in your places of shopping and visiting where you're just saying, God, would you let your light shine forth? God, open the eyes of unbelievers that you would be seen as good and glorious and far too many Christians. Walk into the battlefield empty-handed. So Christian, when was the last time that you began praying earnestly for lostness around you? When was the last time you were praying for someone by name to come and know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? Perhaps you could just think of one name this morning and to commit for a year to say, I'm going to pray for this one My one, I want to see the Lord do something powerful in his life. As a matter of fact, I I have one that I'm praying for right now. And by the power of God and by his being able to remove that blind, I pray that in the coming year, this man will come to know Christ. The world is lost in darkness. It's a It's a spiritual reality. But the reality is that they're also just, they're they're lost in their sin. I I don't know, we can't do it in here because of all the ambient light coming in. But if we had those all blacked out and I could just shut off the lights and it would be completely black in here. I guarantee you that many of you would trip over the pews. And you think, well, those aisles are big. Have you ever walked in your own home at night with the lights off? And that piece of Lego that your child didn't pick up was there? 
or that piano that's been in the same spot for the last 20 years somehow reached out and grabbed your toe while you're walking in the room? I mean, if we can experience kind of the temporary blindness of darkness around us, I want you to consider the fact that we have people living lives that are spiritually dead. They have no idea that they're lost in their darkness. And they're just following whatever light seems appropriate to them. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, but if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And so as Christians, I think we do this weird thing where we expect and we anticipate that the world will act like us. And if the world could just be like us and embrace our values and have all of the things that we believe, then everything would be great. And we take to social media and we combat a world that is lost in their sin and we combat a world that is lost in darkness. And yes, it's appropriate to be salt. We talked about that. But to do so with love because friends, when you expect the world to embrace your values, you cheapen the gospel. When you live with the expectation that the world around me, if they would just think like I do and they would just live like I do, then we would have a good world and a great world and things would be fine. And while there is some truth in that, you cheapen the gospel. And I say that because if the gospel is about doing better and embracing the right values, then Jesus' death was not necessary. See, the gospel is so much more than about embracing the right values and doing the right things. We've taken these things that God has put in our lives to change us and make us light in this world, and we think if we could just transfer our values and our behavior to the rest of the world, then we would be great. But we, we forget and we neglect the fact that the gospel changes lives. We, we forget that the gospel changes life and that God brings spiritual life from death and that only Jesus can truly change people's hearts and lives. So friends, the, the next time you, you just want to come apart over something that you see on social media, maybe a political stance that is very different than your values, Instead of just rushing headlong into the battle and just trying to win the arguments, before you would say anything of truth, wouldn't you just stop and take a moment and say, God, change their hearts and their lives. Because if the light they have is darkness, how great is that darkness? And begin to engage the world in love. Here's what Jesus ultimately says. You're the light of the world. By the way, there's no hiding that fact. There's no getting around it. If you're in Christ, this is who you are. You've been set up. You've been put on a platform. Whether you want people looking at you or not, they're looking and they're watching you. So you're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. You're a lamp that's been put on display. And when people see you and your good works, the scripture says they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Christian, your job Your one task is to reflect the glory of Christ to a watching world. Another way I could say that, Christian, you're on this earth for one reason, to show this world the glory of God, period. God has saved you, redeemed you, called you into fellowship with his son. 
and one day we will enjoy him forever in eternity. But Christian, he hasn't called you to salvation then immediately taking you there. He's left you here so that others would see the glory of God in your life. I bet you wondered why I put this here when I walked up, didn't you? Some of you have just been looking at this the whole time. We're fascinated by lights. I like that one. It's kind of neat. You can put it in water and it'll float. You can throw it and it won't hurt people. Oh, I didn't get it to you. Sorry. Just kind of bounces around. Somebody's going to grab it here in a minute. But this, this little light, we can stare at it. Look at it. Here, toss it back to me. Yeah, see? It's heavier than it looks. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. So this, this light, it's, it's kind of fascinating. You guys have been watching it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this again. Paul, ready? Here you go. Oh, oh, we oh, can see. So that, that, that light, see? It's, it's tricky. It's not just me. All right, Judy, what, toss that to somebody else. Just toss it to somebody else. Anybody, anybody around. There we go. See? You can just toss that light around if you want. People touch it, feel it, look at it. It's curiosity, isn't it? And, and now everybody's just kind of watching, like, where's that light going to go? And what's it going to do? And, and I want to touch it. I want to feel it. And, and there's something about you as a Christian, as a child of God, that should create this kind of curiosity in people's lives. You are shining forth the glory of the one and only God who's made and formed you. You are the light of the world. You are the city on a hill. And this ball can be dropped under pews and lost. And it can bounce around. But you, there's no getting over who you are in Christ. You've been placed front and center to a watching world. You want to know what it, what it means to follow Christ? Look at my life. Watch me. I will show you what it means to follow Christ. I'll show you his goodness and his glory. So when I face a difficult challenge, because life isn't always easy as a Christian, I'll show you what it's like to trust God in the middle of cancer. I'll show you what it's like to trust God in the middle of an economy where you lose your job. I'll show you what it's like to follow Christ when your children are straying from the Lord and you so long for them to be right with Christ. I'll show you what what the glory of Christ looks like when there's blessing. And God has richly blessed me, and I use that to bless others. You are the light of the world. I pray this day that you'd be reminded that you live in spiritual darkness. And that God is using you. There's the tension. I don't know if I want to be on display. I don't know if I want people watching my life. Too bad they already are. So there's, there's the tension. In your life, let your good works point to Christ. And if anyone were ever to say anything to you about your life, your immediate response is to look to Christ. There's my hope. There's my joy. There's my peace. He is all in all to me. I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to ask God to just let that message sink into your heart this morning that you are the light of the world. Would you join me in praying? Father, I thank you this morning for the reminder of who we are in you. We are the light of the world. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning who've gathered in this room. Lord, I pray that they would be consumed with who you are to them and who you are in them. 
the change and the transformation that you brought to their life, and Lord, that they would be courageous to proclaim and to point others to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And oh God, I pray this morning, if there's someone here that recognizes their separation from you, and they know this morning that they are indeed lost in darkness, I pray even now you would help them to turn to you, to repent of their sin and trust the finished work of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, that we are the light of the world. It doesn't really say something special about us. It says something special about the God who's transformed us. We're the light of the world only because we're reflecting the light of the sun. In that respect, we're the moon. Just showing the glory of God that's changed and transformed us. But friend, this morning, if you've never come to place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, if you're resting in your good works and you're embracing the right values and doing the right things, can I tell you that even even doing all the right things will not earn you favor with God? Jesus warned at the end of the sermon that there will be many who come to him on that day saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do so many things in your name? We cast out demons and in your name we did so much. And he'll say, depart from me for I never knew you. Friends, to, to know Jesus as Savior and to embrace him as Lord is simply turning from your sin and turning toward Christ. Turning from those things that you know have separated you from Christ and turning toward the finished work of Jesus upon the cross where he bore in his body the penalty for your sin. And maybe there's someone here this morning that needs to make that commitment. Maybe this morning it's just the time. You just sense that, that veil being lifted from your eyes. You sense a stirring in your heart and you know the Lord is calling you to trust him. There's no magic prayer to pray. There's no magic words that save you, but the Bible says it very plainly. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So maybe the appropriate response from your heart as we stand to sing is just to either stand where you are or stay seated or even to kneel down and just say, God, forgive me a sinner. Give me new life this day. Help me to follow you. And if that's you, I don't want to embarrass you, but if that's you and that's a commitment you're making, you're going to want to tell somebody. And I'd love to rejoice with you this morning. So when I stand here, if that's you and that's a commitment you're making, I want to rejoice with you this morning. Christian, I want to rejoice with you who recognize you are the light of the world too. So maybe during this invitation, this time of responding to God's word, you're your commitment is to say, I'm, I'm ready to be sent forth. And whether you'd say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me, or whether you just be where you are and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Would you let this be a commissioning time for you? You are the light of the world. And it may be that the Lord has just brought you to this place because this is where you belong. This is the body of Christ to you. And you know this is the place God has called you to live your life and to serve him. Friends, whatever commitment you're making to the Lord, would you do so now? Let's stand, let's respond to the Lord and his word as we say.